Our final method to look at is secondary research, which is a little bit out of pattern because it's more of a category rather than an exact method. So the only method we've looked at so far, which is definitely secondary research, is for statistical reports because they were done by someone else. Someone else has created them, we're just using them, which is the definition of secondary research. Primary research, on the other hand, is done, you know, we're doing it ourselves. So the other methods we looked at, you know, interviews, sensors, consumer panels, etc., might be secondary research depending on the exact scenario. But really, you know, if they were initially collected for a purpose different to your current purpose, they would be secondary research. So for example, loyalty scheme, if it was done for just a business purpose and you've got access to the data, that would be secondary research because it wasn't for the exact same purpose as you are doing now. So it does depend on the context, but um, the reports are definitely secondary. There are lots of different potential secondary research methods. One of them we haven't looked at is a search engine. So a search engine, something like Google or Bing, where we can put a query, a question, or any anything into our search bar, and it will find relevant results for us. Much easier than having to learn loads of website addresses. It does the work for us. So, you know, search engines are really, really good, but they are secondary research because, you know, the results Google finds you, for example, are not collect, they're not, you didn't make them. So any information you use via a search engine is secondary research because you haven't done this data collection yourself. And let's evaluate it. So what? So they are really good because you know the data is already there and you've got access to it. So it's quite cheap and easy to utilize. You know, Google is free. You can search for anything. Loads of websites are free as well. Lots of information already collected for you, which is useful. And sometimes the data is good because it's been created by an expert in the field. You might not be an expert in something you're trying to research, maybe IT related, because you're learning it at the moment. You might search something up and an expert has been involved in writing an article or you know, contributing to a website, which may mean that the data you are using, the information really, not data, is more reliable and accurate than it would be if you just sort of made it up yourself or just asked a random person. So lots of websites are made by real experts but not always. So let's talk about what's not so good. It can be hard to verify the source of the data. So teachers will often say, don't ever use Wikipedia as a source, as you know, a place to get data from, because it may have been written by an expert, but it may not have been. And it can be quite hard to tell sometimes who came up with the information that you're using. Were they an expert? Were they just a random person making something up? It can be hard to tell. And likewise, I mean, related to this, the data may not be reliable, it may not be particularly accurate, and there may be some bias in the original uh, collection of data. Bias meaning where you've got some opinion which changes the truth of your, of your article, say. The consequences of it being unreliable and biased are that the information may not be as useful as it should be. And finally, you know, the data may not match your exact purpose, right? You may be looking for something in particular and you get a website which is sort of answering your question, but not fully answering it. And so you're not collecting the exact information which you hoped for. It might still be quite good, but maybe not fully match your purpose because it was written by someone else.